some fixed space-like distance from that origin and call the resulting locus of points to sitter spacetime. And use the metric that you get by calculating lengths into sitter spacetime by just uh, finding a curve you're interested in and then looking at the length of that curve in the end and the Keskin space. So the topology of this thing is going to be, there'll be a picture on the next slide, but the topology is going to be the real numbers product with a sphere of, so in the case we're interested in, a three sphere across with the real numbers. And again, looking at uh, intersections of this thing with uh, hypersurfaces that pass through the origin in the ambient space is going to give you interesting subsets. So if you take a plane in the ambient space that passes through the origin and look at its intersection with Desitter space time, you get all the interesting geodesics. So uh, if the plane uh, is space like null or let's just don't worry about it. I'm going to try to rush a little bit, so i uh, try to be a little disciplined about skipping things. Okay, and the Cauchy, how, how do you get the, their special Cauchy surfaces into Sitter space time? These are three spheres of minimal volume, so it's the opposite of what you have in the uh, Riemannian case. And the way you get them is by looking at those three dimensional, three dimensional hyperplanes, sorry, four dimensional hyperplanes in the ambient five dimensional Minkowski space time intersect those with sitter space time, you would be special Cauchy spaces. So here's the picture. Uh, so the diagrams are all from uh, Schrodinger's book, Expanding Universes. They're very, very beautiful diagrams. Uh, so here we are, we're imagining uh, the Andy of Minkowski space time. This is what the locus of points is going to look like. It's misleading, like all diagrams in Minkowski space time are always misleading, because uh, it looks like this net here right, is really, really special, but it's not. Okay. But that, that's an artifact of the way the diagram is. So we'll talk in a little bit about just how wrong that is. But otherwise, this is the right shape. Okay, so this is this is the right thing to think about, but then you'll see that when you act on it by symmetries, it sort of preserves that shape and different parts of it end up playing what looks like the special roles, so the role isn't so special. Is that the time line direction? Yeah, so Z is the timeline direction. Here's the origin. And this is like one unit of space like separation. Uh, all the points on this surface are one unit of space like separation from the origin. Okay, so what, how does the Sitter's kind of space time come up with general relativity? Well, it's a vacuum solution for positive lambda where the size of lambda is just given by the size of the De Sitter space time. So each De Sitter space time has a radius, right? You have to pick a size there. From now on, we'll just say it's one, so we don't have to worry. And there's a sense in which we sort of think, okay, this is the ground state of the gravitational field for positive lambda, in the sense that it's the solution of maximum symmetry. Right? In the four-dimensional case, it, the symmetry group is ten-dimensional, just like the quantum ray group. Uh, it's conforming to flat, no surprise. So we're sort of thinking everything that's going on here that's different from Minkowski space is all due to lambda. There's no other funny business. Okay. So. Onto some weirdnesses of Sitter space time. So hopefully uh, we'll talk about Sitter space time and how weird it is, and then we'll talk about asymptotically Sitter space times, which is like things that aren't Sitter space time uh, but become like it in the future, which is basically everything when you're talking about positive lambda in general. Okay, so first thing, it's homogeneous but not static. Okay, so I think this is uh, the huge difference from Minkowski space time that time is is harder to think about in the De Sitter case. So it's homogeneous. Um, so just like when you're working with the sphere, the isometry group of the sphere is all the rotations and reflections of the ambient Euclidean space that leave the origin invariant. And analogously, when you're talking about De Sitter space time, the symmetries are all the Lorentz symmetries of the ambient Minkowski space time that leave the origin invariant. Just like on the sphere, you can map if, you, if I give you two points, you can map one to the other by doing a rotation. Similarly here, any two points on the center space time are equivalent geometrically. There's an isometry that maps one to the other. Okay, so that looks weird. We'll go back to this picture, but like say I give you this point and this point. Okay, so first thing you do is you rotate, right? That's easy, that's obviously a symmetry. And then you do a Lorentz boost in the ambient space to get up here. And that's 
Those are basically all the moves you have, and they're always enough. Oh, sorry. So uh, it's homogeneous, and the geometry looks exactly the same at each point. So now you're going to be like, okay, yeah, so nothing ever happens there, right? So, like, it should be static, right? It's your first idea. Like, <laughs> time evolution should just, like, map one given spatial geometry to another, and it should always be the same one, because after all, everything looks the same. But no, it's not static. Right? So static in general only has a precise meaning that there should be a time-like killing field, right? So a vector field on the whole space-time whose integral curves uh, are time-like, and so that the geometry looks the same point at the same each point on each integral curve. And there is no such killing field in the space time. Okay, so uh, there, the problem is, if we go back to the thing, if you imagine I want to map this point to this point, I do a Lorentz boost. Okay? Well, what goes on over here is you map from here to here. What goes on in between is you do something space-like. Every isometry of this thing sometimes relates to space like related points. So there's no time like isometry. One parameter group of time like isometries, there's no killing field that's not static. No, we're talking about global. Yes, for now. So, so far. Okay, so this is weird, right? It's, it's strange for us to think of time this way that, oh yeah, it's homogeneous, it's always the same, but it's not static. And for the it falls directly from the fact that there's no time-like killing field. And if you're trying to do field theory, quantum field theory, or classical field theory on a fixed acidic space-time, then there's no Hamiltonian framework uh, in, of the usual kind. You'd probably cook up some crazy time to that one, uh, relative to this uh, And there's going to be no particles uh, in the Okay, And this is uh, our reality. So, I mean, no particles means not even like a fog representation? I mean, it's not like right. an element of kind of... No, 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 right. That's what I'm thinking. No fog representations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've got to make some very arbitrary choices to make a fog representation. There are quantum field theories, but they don't go through that route. Okay, so let's... I uh, forget about Einstein. Um, let's... <laughs> <laughs> it's too much Einstein last time. We don't need it. Okay, so... Um, I want to talk about simultaneity, right? So there's already this weird thing, okay, homogeneous but not static, okay, but that tells us something weird about time. What does simultaneity look like in this space? So the way to get there is by, uh, the easy way to get there is by, first of all, talking about the conformal completion of Desider space time. So let's remind everybody, like, here's the Poincaré disk, right? This is the entire infinite hyperbolic plane. Rescale meter sticks to make it finite. Uh, now this is just, this is just a uh, reminder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's going on here, we've obviously distorted distances. We've squished an infinite thing into a finite thing. We've added a boundary, but we haven't distorted angles. Right? So that's what's so beautiful about this map. So all these triangles, uh, are, in the original hyperbolic plane, they were all the same size and they all had the same angles. Here they're different sizes, but they all have the same angles. And there are going to be some like super cool things we can talk about, like um, you know, a point on the boundary is going to correspond to a family of hyperparallel lines. All the lines are in the same direction will meet at the same point at infinity. They don't literally ever meet, but there's a point at infinity that we can add and think of them as meeting. We want to do the same thing with Sitter space time. Exactly the same thing. Right? So the way we do it, <coughs> instead of mapping it. In, uh, the thing that's going to play the role of the disk is the Einstein static universe. Okay, so remember what the Einstein static universe is like. Um, it's a nice, simple, relativistic space time. So it's a static solution with spherical spatial sections that maintain their volume over time. Okay, so the metric just was like dt plus the three sphere metric. Right? As simple as you could get. And what we're going to do is consider a finite segment of it. So it's like this. Okay. Basically a cylinder where the sections, instead of being circles, are three spheres. Maintain the they maintain their volume over time. We're going to look at just a finite chunk of it. And we're going to choose the length of the chunk to be such that um, a photon can make it exactly halfway around through that stretch of time. Okay. 
if you include the points on the boundary. If you don't include the points on the boundary, then a photon can't make it out there. And then we're going to like uh, rescale our uh, meter sticks and clocks so that we can switch the whole infinite to center space time down into here. We're going to do that in a way that distorts time and space measurements, but leaves angle measurements invariant. In particular, 45 degrees is still how light travels in the squished up version. So, which frame is that in the photon? Sorry, I couldn't help. So, you said you should have taken the length of the way that the photon Yeah, I, so I, I, I'm starting with the infinite Einstein static universe, and I'm cutting out a finite temporal segment, temporally finite segment, and I chose the length of that segment to be such that a photon can make it halfway around. Right, so I send a photon at the beginning of time, it's halfway around the plane. So if I send two in opposite directions, they meet at infinity. Okay. And when you say we're preserving angles, we're preserving hyperbolic angles. Yes. Conformal. Yeah. I mean it's a conformal isometry. Okay, so now I'm gonna like unroll my cylinder into a square. Because I want to draw some pictures here. So basically, I want to consider the image in this conformal uh, squishing of a time-like geodesic into center space time. And so now I know what we just said was uh, in the squishing, if at the beginning of time we send out two photons in opposite directions, then they'll meet at infinity. That means they make it to these corners. And if you think instead about light that can reach this world line, then you get Two photons set from the same point before can meet at this guy. So this is the crucial diagram. Right? If you look at everything that can signal this world line, it takes up half of the squished to sitter space time. If you look at everything that it can signal, it takes up a different half that overlaps. If you look at everything that it can signal and be signaled by, it takes up this middle diamond, which is four. Okay. All right, so this is just some notation that a lot of you are going to be familiar with, right? So L is going to be a world line. I picked a straight one here, a freely falling one. I didn't have to. If you think about it, if I drew in a squiggly line that ended at the same two points here, these lines would fall in the same. All that matters for any world line is which points at plus and minus infinity you start or end at. It doesn't matter what you do in between as far as the structure of this other line. Okay, so pick any line. J plus is the set of points that you can signal from points on that line. J minus is the set of points that can send signals to it. Each of those takes up one half, like we said, and their intersection takes up a quarter. So this is the one, this is the portion you can signal and be signaled by. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about simultaneity. So first of all, cast your mind back to the Kesky space time. You've already forgotten how nice it was. Right? Uh, it's easy. If I give you an inertial world line in Minkowski space time, it's easy to define simultaneity. So easy that you could do it lots of different ways that are equivalent. So here's the operational one. Right? You've got this observer, and she wants to assign times on her world line to distant points. So she's constantly sending out signals, which are constantly being bounced back, and somehow she keeps track of things very well. And so if if she sends out a signal and she gets it back, she's like, ah, the reflection event occurred halfway between, is simultaneous with an event on my world line that occurred halfway between those two. The simultaneity surfaces you get doing that are exactly the same ones you get if you're just like, I take the world line and I look for all the flat hypersurfaces that are orthogonal to it. Right? A nice geometric world line has to coincide here. Or another thing you might do is find a bunch of world Given your world line, find a whole family of world lines uh, that are parallel to it, and then look at the hypersurfaces that are going to all of them. Those three procedures are equivalent in Minkowski space time. So let's think about the first one uh, in the sitter space time. So in the first one, uh, you just got your one world line, and that world line sends out signals and gets them back. Right? So that's telling you already that our surfaces of simultaneity are going to be restricted to this diamond here because that represents the set of points to which we can send signals and expect to get them back. 
point out here, um, right? I can signal it, but I can't, I can't get the signal back before the end of time. Okay, so we know that our simultaneity surfaces, if we use the Einstein simultaneity procedure, aren't going to cover the whole space time. Okay, but interestingly, they will cover this patch. Uh, this patch is called the static patch because we can write the metric, the desider metric, restricted <laughs> to this patch in this form. Okay, so this is in, worth pausing over, right? So here we have, here we just have three sphere metric boring. Oh, sorry, two sphere metric boring, scaled by r squared. But, okay. um, these two, uh, so if you dropped this factor out front, that would just look like Minkowski. Right? But with those factors there, that's telling you, as you go out to the boundaries of the static patch, um, uh, you know, this is going to minus infinity, and this is becoming undefined. And so something weird is going on with rods and meter sticks, or clocks or something, if you're thinking about this in the classic way. Um, you have your scale with plus one constant, right? Because yeah. that sets the value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the cool thing is that this time coordinate, whose level surfaces are the, the instance of time according to this observer, is a killing vector on this, uh, it's differential, is a killing vector on this patch. So on this patch, we can pretend space-time is static. Okay. Not on the whole thing, but on this patch. But the geodesic we started with, the time-like geodesic we started with, is the only time-like geodesic that spends its entire life in this patch. <coughs> okay. So you can say, OK, this is my whole world. Right. It's static. Unfortunately, I'm doomed uh, to die alone. <laughs> <laughs> or at least there's nobody that I'll be born with and also die with. Okay, so the, strictly speaking, what it, what we know is, in order for for any other observer at all, it has to have infinite acceleration either in the past or in the future in order to stay uh, in the static patch. It, it's hard. Okay, so there's something going on that's driving people out of your static patch, which is otherwise so nice. So here. Uh, this isn't an ideal picture, but you can sort of see at the neck here, the static patch is this part. Okay, the, at the neck here, it is half of this, I think. But as you go up, it's a tiny and tiny fraction of the available space-time room. Okay, that's, that's what the static patch looks like. Uh, I, we'll see what the surfaces of simultaneity look like in that, but you can probably guess. Um, Okay, we, got, we can also do the symmetry thing, right? So we can say, okay, I got my world line. Um, now I want to look at, for each point of my world line, I find a, a Cauchy surface of minimum volume that's orthogonal to my world line at that point. That's the equivalent of the nice geometric thing we do in Minkowski space time. Uh, and then we get a one parameter uh, family of Cauchy surfaces orthogonal to our world line. So now, you know, these things, uh, at least they go all the way around the thing, right? But uh, they cover only half of the sitter space time and they cross. Okay, so here's the picture. Uh, so I'm going like this. So obviously, at the equator, the special thing orthogonal to my world line at that point is going to be the next thing. When I go up here, well, what's happened? To get from here to here, you have to do a Lorentz boost in the ambient space time. So to get from this, <laughs> so the thing that's orthogonal here, you have to boost the thing you started with. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to end up with one of these things, which is going to cross the one you started with. And you're never going to get anything in this part. Right? You're basically covering the static patch of this observer and the static patch of uh, her equal twin. Okay. So this is actually what the uh, surfaces of constant time look like in the static patch. They they never quite meet the boundary, so they don't cross. But they would if you tried to continue them. And they only cover this portion. OK, so they're not, they're weird. They're weirder than you would have expected, maybe, when it's, it seemed like they were so great that they were uh, the level surfaces of uh, you know, time parameter that had this nice behavior. <coughs> um, 
Why do you find it weirder than, let's say, just being outside? Let's say you're in the cross of four minutes and you're describing the uh, black hole horizon. I mean, this is well, the horizon, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, I think that's, I mean, that, that or good. Or regular space in the Gaussian. Good. That, that, that's exactly, I mean, okay. I, it, it took people a long time to realize what was going on here. But let me just say, it's weird in that sense. Like Einstein for, and De Sitter were extremely confused by the behavior of these surfaces that's and why they got to the, the horizon. Uh, to me, that's a, a, a metric of weirdness. All right. How surprised uh, you know those guys are when they find out about. Oh, they were confused about horizons. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, we can also do co-moving coordinates uh, observers. So we can't sort of find a bunch of observers who are always parallel to us. It doesn't really make any sense because the space time is expanding basically, right? But we can do something like that. We can, um, you know, I take my world line. I look at a point on it, I pick the orthogonal hypersurface, so I might as well think of that as the neck right now. Then I find a bunch of observers who are, uh, think of themselves as at rest when they go through that hypersurface. Now I look at all the hypersurfaces orthogonal to that whole family of observers. That's a nice thing to do. We again get, now we have something that covers the whole space time. Um, and the metric looks kind of cool, right? So the d, d t squared thing, plus hyperbolic cosine squared of t times the three square vector. What's that saying? It's saying, according to this coordinate system, which is sort of adapted to these observers who are all at rest here, space is rapidly expanding in the future, like exponentially fast, and exponentially fast expanding in the past. So it's like the universe is created infinitely long ago, rushing inwards at unbounded velocity, it like, Lambda's trying to make it expand. Here it reaches a crisis, and then it starts expanding, uh, and they, they look exactly the same. Obviously, this is, there's a reflection. So. Now, here's another way you can do it with co-moving coordinates. Instead of uh, starting with my world line and a point of my world line and the Cauchy surface of minimal volume orthogonal to that, you can say, I'm going to start with my world line, a point of my world line, and look for a Euclidean three space hidden into center space time orthogonal to my world line at that point. Then I find a whole family of observers, each considering it to be a, itself to be at rest as it passes through that thing. Now I look for the whole family of Euclidean three spaces, all orthogonal to all of those observers. You might have been surprised you could do this, right? The Cauchy surfaces have to all be the same, so they're all three spheres. But there are these infinite Euclidean spaces. So people sometimes say, like, this is a nice kind of example to show is you shouldn't just talk about topology of space. It doesn't literally speak in make sense in some contexts. And when you do this and use the right kind of coordinates, what you get is some people who uh, all see Euclidean space expanding exponentially fast towards the future. So, I mean, this is very hard to draw. This is one of the reasons why I think the Schrodinger diagrams are so great. Uh, so you can sort of see these are the surfaces of uh, time in this cosmologically expand, uh, cosmological patch. So as you go backward on this world line, you will always have a Euclidean three space like this all the way back. Now, of course, you can see this is getting very narrow here. You've really got to, you've really got to thread the needle to get them all in there. But they go back all the way back to the beginning of time. And what this is covering here is the whole causal future of the world line you're talking about. Okay, so the static patch is just this, the points that it can signal and be signaled by. But this covers everything it can signal. Okay, and so as you go out towards infinity in the plus direction, you start to cover the whole surface. Okay, so those are two, that's one way of trying to come up with these two patches, the cosmological patch and the static patch. In addition to being interestingly different geometrically, they also cover very different parts. Um, is your guy at rest in that space? Does that question make sense? Well, yeah, so think of it as uh, an expanding FRW metric, which is basically what it is. So each guy thinks of himself as at rest relative to each of the surfaces of time. All the observers think that, and the observers are rushing away from each other exponentially fast. So this it's is also great for inflation, right? Yes. It's a different yeah. Okay, so good. We got somewhere, right? We got to the end of the consider, strictly consider part. And my conclusion is time is strange in consider. Uh, so, like, one thing that's strange is 
the metaphors we usually use, flowing and so on, really depend on thinking about time-like killing vectors as telling us about temporal symmetry. There's nothing like that here. Uh, you know, rolling is, seems like the closest metaphor because these Lorentz transformations really are more like rotations than time translations. So there is, except in the static patch, there is no such thing as time translation into Sitter's space. Okay, weird. Oh, I didn't get to the end. Oh, I forgot. Um, okay, let's talk about this quickly. So, take this three. Take take an ordinary two sphere. Right, just the surface of the ball. Cut it in half and identify opposite points on the boundary. Okay, that gives you a, a surface which you can't picture because it's not oriented. Locally, it has the geometry of the sphere. It also has the rotation group as a group of symmetry, but you can't picture it because uh, you know uh, you can change an L into a capital gamma by just going around. Another way you could picture this is instead of cutting the sphere in half, you could start with a sphere and go to a new surface whose points are the lines uh, in three space that pass through the origin of the sphere. That's the same operation. Well, so those are that's the that's elliptic. If, if it has the metric, it's elliptic geometry. If it doesn't have the metric, it's projective geometry. Don't respect down on oriental spaces though. Yeah, Nick can picture them. <laughs> if you want a picture, ask him. I have a crochet one. Yeah, I've seen those. I'm very surprised. Okay, so we can do that with Desider, right? It's it's the sphere, right? So um, you know you've got the huge hyperboloid, right? And you're like, what what corresponds to going identifying opposite points? It's like just reflect your thing through the origin, right? So put a minus, to, to pick your favorite point. Uh, put minus signs in front of all its coordinate values that will reflect you through the origin and give you the antipodal point. And you can, if you like, make a new space time that locally looks just like the center space time and has the same symmetry group, but which is non time orientable uh, by doing this identification. So you can think of it as like cutting along the boundary of the cosmological patch and gluing together antipodal points on the boundaries that would give you uh, one way. Okay, so Maudlin's been like hovering over the room as uh, people's villain with choice this week, so uh, I'll put him in here. No physicist or philosopher <laughs> has ever suggested the physical possibility of a temporally non oriental space time. It's not strictly speaking true. Here's Schrodinger. <laughs> he talks about this thing. He first of all says, oh, you may be worried because there's going to be closed time like curves, and then he argues that there are. And he's like, well, that removes the objection. Uh, to the intended identification of the activities, this move. Uh, but there's a circumstance which, to my view, constantly su suggests it. It's this. The potential experience of an observer who moves on an arbitrary timeline worldwide from the infinite past to the infinite future includes just one half of ds, which half depends on which worldwide he follows. Right? So remember, if we think we start back here, we're like, oh, all the places I could go, right? That's all the places I could signal, that's this. Uh, it's for any observer, no matter where they start and no matter what path they follow, it's always at the beginning of time half of the, the sitter space they can reach. If I started here instead, right, it would be like this half. It wouldn't look as centered, but otherwise it's the same amount of the sitter space. Schroeder thinks that's weird. Right? He thinks it would be way cooler if uh, everybody uh, had as their potential object of future experience is the whole space time. So here is, I, I expect you to think that's weird. I, I think it's weird. Yeah. Here is a sort of his like Hegelian uh, explanation of this. Still we, or at least at any rate some of us, are used to regard the real world around us as a mental construct based on the community experience of all normal sane persons. <laughs> From this point of view, one may find it distasteful to accept a world model according to which two observers who separate are likely to have a possible sharing of their experience stopped with regard to some parts of it uh, that are interesting and relevant to them respectively. Indeed, this will happen sooner or later unless they reach the distant future of precisely the same as a right, like walk down. One way of avoiding this is to accept the elliptic interpretation. Okay, so there's some idea about the 
functional role of spacetime here that he thinks is better fulfilled by elliptic decision spacetime than by decision spacetime. Okay, now you may say that was the old days. Okay, but here's somewhat newer days. This is paper of well, so around 2000. I, I, would, I would say it was around when we were working with sort of CFD, I would say 2003, 2004. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is a paper that came out. These guys were advocating a return to elliptic to pseudo space time, and there were a bunch of papers around the same time, right? You were on yeah, one yeah, of them. Yeah. Um, so these guys, in this paper, we consider the consequences of the elliptic interpretation. We find that elliptic to center space has some remarkable properties. Indeed, not only does it lead to a concrete realization of observer complementarity, or on that assignment, it also improves the nature of many of the severe theoretical challenges that the center space time presents. It, the, the severe theoretical challenges are, include, it has two boundaries, and that's really, that's a real pain if you want to find uh, a, 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 the De Sitter version of the ADS CFT. Yeah. One would be much more convenient, and that's what you get if you do the return. Okay, what is this observer complementarity thing? Okay, this is from the same paper. The arguments that led to black hole complementarity can also be applied to other types of event horizons, in particular to cosmological event horizons. So uh, here we're thinking of, for this observer, relative to this observer, this is the cosmological horizon. Okay. The points, it, it's the boundary between the points they can signal and the points they can't signal at, over their entire life. A better name, uh, so uh, yeah, black hole complementarity taught us something, and it applies to things like this. A better name would therefore be observer complementarity. In its strongest form, it postulates that each observer has complete information and can, in principle, describe everything that happens within his or her cosmological horizon using pure states. It's a crucial problem. This information may appear different to different observers in, comp uh, in you know, complementary guises. One observer may pass smoothly through the horizon, whereas another observer may see there a source of hot radiation. Although these drastically different realities may seem to be inconsistent, it's important to recognize that paradoxes arise only when one takes the unphysical perspective of the global super observer. So this is like actually not so different from <coughs> Thinking that um, uh, there's something wrong with the big picture that allows observers uh, uh, to separate and never see each other again. But there's this extra new thought that, um, yeah, really, uh, in the full to center space time, it could happen that two people separated, right? And now, um, sorry, that's, a, that's a bad way to go. Um, two people separate back here. Okay. At some point in the future, at some point, they'll no longer be able to signal each other anymore. If they uh, don't. The idea is here, each of them continues to have complete information. You might think that's ruled out by the fact that they are in different parts of the universe and can't signal each other. The point of this is to say, no, we have to cook up the physics so that they can. And the way it's going to be done is by adding extra physical degrees of freedom relative to you, on the horizon relative to you, that keeps track of everything in the entire universe. Or we could just do the easy thing and pass what we can consider space now. We have to do it all those trips. Okay, I think that's uh, a lot of weird stuff. So uh, you didn't mention Gary Gibbons. No. He's was, was very important because he pointed out that this elliptic interpretation really goes to the heart of quantum theory. So he's that because, as you know, is then you have to work with real Hilbert space. Yeah. And it's amazing to me that Schrodinger didn't point this out. But Gary, did, this is an important point. Yeah, 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 I, 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 I totally agree. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, what is this is like a super important it? paper in between Schrodinger and this, this one I was just talking about. But it, it's by, I mean, these guys are taking their inspiration from both given center. Okay, so let's now talk about asymptotically distributed space times. Okay, so what's going on here? We don't think we live in Minkowski space time. <laughs> when we thought that lambda was zero, we didn't think we lived in Minkowski space time. We could see there was matter all over the place. I think. So there couldn't be zero curvature. The same, for the same reason, we now don't think we live in distributed space time. If we think lambda is positive, to consider space time might be an interesting model being the simplest positive lambda of space time, but it's not ours. Okay, but we'll see there are several interesting senses in which 
When you have positive lambda, uh, it becomes n n nigh inevitable that your future will be to center life. Okay, so we want to talk about space times that maybe start with uh, a big bang, but have positive lambda. What happens as t goes to plus infinity in space times like that? So those are the uh, those are the we want to study the asymptotics of those space times with in the positive lambda setting, and you know I've sort of given away that the asymptotics are going to be considered like so we call them asymptotically considered. So you will be doing yeah, let's 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 forget about the other. I get Okay. <laughs> you don't have to. Um, uh, but because we want there to be a big bang, we we, we want there and, and then there to be stuff spread out. We, we want there to be temporal orientation again, just just for present purposes. Right, but this would be very fun. Yeah, 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 I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I Okay, so just this is three slides. This is a slide with three topics that I was tempted to spend like an hour and a uh, half on each in making this talk, and then I decided to spend less than an hour and a half on each of them. Okay, so partly because they're picky technical things to talk about, but I think they're like super interesting and provide like, uh, if you get fired up about this, I think these would be like really interesting uh, uh, things to read about and try to get across. Okay. So one problem is there's just like an enormous variety of way of different inequivalent definitions of asymptotically considered. Um, and you know, some of them differ in sort of like it's like like small ways, but uh, some of them differ in quite dramatic ways, like for instance, what kind of asymptotic symmetries you get, um, and how useful they are for like say measuring gravitational radiation, uh, for treating model of gravitational radiation in a consider setting. And there's a tremendous uh, amount of disagreement about how to work all this out. Okay, so that's one thing. Second thing, again, okay, remember I said before, just in the Sitter case, we don't get a Hamiltonian if we try to do field theory on a fixed center background. Related problem. So in the lambda equals zero setting, we can define mass and charge and angular momentum for isolated systems. It's like tremendous triumph of general relativity that took decades and decades to work out. For instance, it was an extremely important mathematical result to prove that the mass is always non-negative. Okay. It's like really, really big deal. Um, really hard, but the basic idea is really simple. You can just sort of like um, do what you want to do in Maxwell space, uh, in Maxwell's theory in McCuskey space time. You could just define the charge of an isolated body by looking at what, like the flux or something over larger and larger three spheres, and you capture all the information. There's a general relativistic version of that that allows you to look at the mass of an isolated system by looking at the way the metric components behave on larger and larger three spheres as you go to spatial infinity. And it turns out that things like mass and charge and angular momentum can all be defined this way if you impose the right kinds of boundary conditions at spatial infinity when lambda equals zero. And then you can show that they're conserved quantities and they have amazing features and it's all awesome. Super awesome. We don't expect there to be conserved quantities in that sense in the positive lambda sector of general activity because there's not going to be an asymptotic symmetry of time translation, which is what you need to make sense of these things that you conserve quantities. So there's no known way to give a general definition of mass or charge or angular momentum for an isolated system in the positive lambda sector of general activity. Uh, so what does that mean? We need to be more clever. Do we need to give up on the idea that we have definitions like that? <laughs> uh, this isn't exactly like probably a good research project for philosophers uh, to try to solve this problem. But I think like just getting clear on what the options are and the dialectic and state planes would be really good. And then another, this is a sort of, you can read some recent papers by Ashtakar and collaborators if you want to think about this, like what, um, Let me put this a little more technically then, to get it over. Uh, in the positive lambda setting, it's not just an, it's not just in consider space time that conformal infinity is space like like this. It's through the whole sector. Okay, so um, there's like this tremendous discontinuity between the lambda equals zero setting, where the, the infinity where null gsd six end is an ideal null boundary for the space time. 
and this setting where it's always space empty. And that's telling you this limit here is very weird. And that raises questions about when it's safe to do what we normally do, to talk about gravitational radiation and so on. We normally, everything is done still in the uh, conformal completion of Minkowski spacetime as if lambda equals zero. Is that, is that okay or not? Given that we know that this limit, things, some things go wrong in that limit, some things don't. Are the calculations safe or not? Okay, yeah, and just, just look at Ashton Carter's most recent papers. They're uh, amazing. Okay. Let's hopefully get less technical for a while. So hair and topology, uh, two extremely interesting features uh, of this setting. So first of all, there's no hair. It'll be really clear. Uh, so uh, the cosmic no hair conjecture, uh, not to be confused with the, uh, uh, the black hole version, cosmic, cosmic no hair conjecture, says that de Sitter spacetime is a dynamical attractor in a very strong sense. For reasonable matter sources, generic future geodesically complete solutions of the Einstein field equations should look like the sitter space time to late time observers. So this is, if, if you replace the sitter with Minkowski and lambda positive with lambda zero, this would not be true. Okay? Because the space time is awesome, but it's not a dynamical attractor in this extremely strong sense. Okay, so there's something, and the point about, uh, uh, but generic, because everybody, you know, there's always going to be counterexamples these things. Uh, but hopefully they're sparse. Um, GD is complete. Well, I mean, if you cook up, uh, if, you, if you put matter in the right way, you expect black holes to form. That takes us outside the scope of the conjecture. This is just for uh, solutions without black holes. Okay, and so this is a way of sort of trying to make it precise. Like, basically, uh, in one of these space times where it holds, for any observer, uh, their thing corresponding to a static patch will look more. Oh, sorry, no, that's wrong. <clears throat> Didn't try to rush. Uh, here's the statement. So, roughly speaking, we want to say a space time is future asymptotically considered if it contains a Cauchy surface, <clears throat> so somewhere down near the beginning of time, think of it, such that for any observer, if you look at the. the the, causal the part of the causal past of the observer that lies to the future of the Cauchy surface, you find that it can be sliced into initial data surfaces that become arbitrarily similar at late times to flat slices in the cosmological patch. So it looks, in particular, not just like the center, but it looks like the cosmological patch. It looks more and more like an exponentially expanding, spatially flat patch from some time onwards. Right? That's the point of the signal. Don't let what happens at early times mess you up with that. So if the intuition here is in the static patch, it looks like the inside of a black hole. So this, if, if you look at like the inside of a black hole, say like, well, there's no hair. Right. So right. Matter, so. Right. Right. Or just, I mean, another way to think is like, you know, what does lambda do? It causes expansion. If the expansion is uh, exponential, yeah, totally. like, you know, everything's being like massively separated. I mean, it's just becoming more. It it, it should just become more and more empty. Uh, and it does. And it, like, if there was any matter or gravitational energy, everything's just like stretched out. Uh, if it doesn't form a black hole and it has the chance at the beginning, it's going to look, it's going to be a ghost town later. Okay. And um, so there's a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, interesting uh, proofs. There's a bunch of proofs of interesting versions of this conjecture, but, you know, far, far from uh, the whole thing. But something that might especially interest people is, uh, this Holland's paper that uh, does it for quantum field theories, uh, including some fairly tame interacting quantum field theories in a sort of formal sense of those. Okay, another uh, thing that I think, I mean, this is actually one of the things I think philosophers should uh, be gripped by in the Sitter uh, setting. So, you know, um, there's this literature going back to the 70s. Uh, about whether or not we can detect cosmic topology in general activity. Um, uh, but it's a sort of, uh, well, it uses a, a sense of detecting cosmic topology that's quite different from the one I'm about to talk to, talking about. This one is more physics-y. You don't have to rely on weirdo 
uh, uh, bespoke uh, uh, space times to get your examples and counterexamples. The dynamics does it for you. Okay, so let's say a standard cosmological model is a spatially flat solution of the Einstein Lazarus equations with positive lambda with spatial slices R3 or a push with R3. And why Einstein blasts off that maybe most people in here have never encountered before? It's like, it's mathematically convenient for the guy proving the theorem. It uh, simulates radiation at early phases and dust at late phases, so it's actually pretty good as an approximation. And all this can also be done with uh, a nonlinear scalar field. Um, so it's not as special as it sounds like. Okay, so what's the picture here? Well, you know, like if you read a, uh, well, cosmologists will say, like, yeah, we now we know lambda uh, is non-zero, and we also have excellent evidence that we're in a spatially flat uh, universe that's exponentially expanding. Will be exponentially expanding as lambda really gets bigger. Okay, so this is like from the point of view that we're taking right now. This is like the kind of cosmological model that we think provides an excellent approximation when we're talking about the universe as if it was homogeneous and isochronic. Okay, so like all of the evidence that uh, you would use to get people started doing cosmology, right, before you start to mention the sophisticated stuff, uh, could be captured using one of these things. And so in particular, these things are homogeneous and uh, isotropic, right, because they're spatially flat. Now, so long as we stick with exact spatial flatness, exact homogeneity and isochronic, that means there's very few topologies consistent with our observations. The observations say, if, if, it, you, know, if you have to pick a homogeneous isotropic one, it's going to be flat. The only manifolds you can put a flat metric on are like R3 and quotients of R3. But in the three, world of three manifolds, that's highly, highly restricted. There's an awful lot of manifolds you can't put a flat metric on. So, but obvious question, like, of course, the observations only suggest that our universe is approximately described by one of these because it's obvious if you look outside that the universe is not exactly homogeneous and isotropic. So the obvious question is, what sort of spatial topologies are possible if we require only that each observer think of our universe as looking approximately like a standard cosmology at late times, or after certain times? And the answer, due to this guy uh, Ringstrom, is now any topology is consistent with observations. Observe, but current observations place no constraint on spatial topology whatsoever. Okay, so there's a sense in which uh, spatial topology is not going to be uh, detectable using the kinds of observations we can get so far. Because lambda is positive, this thing doesn't happen when lambda is zero. Okay, so what, you know, why? Well, in a universe like us, there's an early Cauchy surface past which we can't see corresponding to like decoupling or something like that. You can't see what the kind of probes we have. And if you look at, go back to that early hypersurface, and now look at um, the future of any observer, all the data you need to predict everything that happens in that, in the whole J minus of that observer's worldwide, right? Not, like not just, in, in the whole, like you take their whole infinite future world line, you take the, everything that's in the past light cone of any point of that, all the data you need to need to determine what's going to happen in that whole region is encoded in a finite ball on this early hypersurface. So we're not going to be able to detect topology because all the data we're ever going to get is only telling us about what's happening in a finite ball on an early. Uh, so there are these people who write the claim, um, you probably know their names, the claim that you can actually detect uh, right, the effects of topology if you go to the, not the first peak in CNB, but the previous one, right, where basically you always have the largest error bars because of cost invariance. Right, right, right. Yeah, I should say, okay, so this is a good point. So if the universe were small enough, then we would just see like double images of stars. If, 
you know, we see the sun looking at straight at the sun. If we look away, we see like a very faint copy of the sun in the other direction. If the universe were small enough, that the light would go all the way around and it reaches again, right? So it's it's actually possible that we could get data um, that would give us strong evidence that space had some particular topology. But this is saying there's no topology it could have that's inconsistent. Uh, <coughs> with the observations that make us think it's a, merely approximately homogeneous and isotropic. So there are some further kinds of special data you could add that would be smoking guns for some topologies. Uh, but the kind of data we have now, which is like, doesn't include those kinds of signals, uh, as far as most people think, uh, leads the question of the topology. Okay, so yeah. I think this is the last time. And let's see if this works. Well, it's hard to tell because it's going to take a second to load because now we're finally at our I move. Uh, <laughs> um, and it looks like it needs to be clicked to actually happen. Oh, Nick, I'll never have the coordination to do this. So you've just got to click anywhere on the image. There he goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm glad I'm glad <laughs> you can perhaps imagine how much time I spent working on that one. <laughs> and obviously, you should read the title. It's like Bullsman Brains. <laughs> I really wanted him to say brains, but I couldn't figure out how to do this. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have breakfast again, Chris. No, I don't. Oh, oh, oh there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, but still, all I want to carry. <laughs> So say uh, you, li you lived in a spatially finite universe whose volume was constant, and it, it's e eternal towards the future. Right? So what should you expect? Say, say it had a beginning that was very low entropy. What do you expect is, um, well, you know, the entropy's going to keep going up. So maybe you'll get a phase that looks a little bit like this, with the organization and so on, but then it's going to keep going up, and things are going to get really boring. Right? It's going to reach equilibrium. And then, you know, it's an equilibrium thing in a finite box. So. Uh, Poincaré recurrence tells us, like, every once in a while, we'll go arbitrarily close to any state you like. So, in the future, there'll be fluctuations back down to low energy. But by far the most common ones won't be all the way back to, like, Big Bang entropy, but to intermediate levels. Now, at some of those intermediate levels, there will be, like, records and living things and so on. Right? Incredibly similar to what we see around us. Um, but those things won't have, like, been preceded by super low entropy paths, they will just like fluctuate out of chaos. And non, the non chaotic part of the universe will be relatively small, so the chaos will like come zooming in and destroy them. They won't get to look at whole lives. Now, the Boltzmann brains problem, but due to Boltzmann basically, but with better name, a better name now, uh, is we think, you know, we have all this evidence, we look around us, like we think it's evidence for a low entropy Big Bang past. But if the universe is infinite towards the future, no matter how small the probability is of something like this room coming into being exactly like this, it will happen infinitely often. And so in the whole universe, there are like, there, there's like maybe one copy of you that lives in a room like this that had, was preceded by Big Bang low entropy immediately. And then there's infinitely many copies of you that uh, just fluctuated out of chaos and are about to get eaten up by chaos. So why should you be so sure you're the one uh, with the one? Okay, so this is like uh, one of those excellent kind of science fiction problems that uh, physicists like, uh, that we also like, so uh, it's, it's great. Okay, so lambda and Boltzmann brains. Right, so that, that, was, that was for a spatially finite universe of constant volume. 
it was important that it didn't grow in volume because we wanted to appeal to Poincaré recurrence, which requires that the energy, energy surface of the phase space be active. That's not going to be true if the universe expands forever. So can we get the Boltzmann brains if we just imagine like a bunch of classical particles bouncing around into center space time? No, right? Because, I mean, the short reason is uh, basically every particle is going to end up isolated in its own static patch because of expansion. The, I gave a sort of longer, more boring argument, but it amounts to that. Uh, and it was quite similar to some of the things you were saying earlier. Okay. Just, just get rid of that thing. <laughs> it's uh, my usual attitude towards it. Um, okay, but what about that's if it's that's if it's consider plus classical. What if it's consider plus quantum? So the dominant view among contemporary cosmologists is that you should expect infinitely many Boltzmann brains in our consider-like future. So we we basically think because of the no-heron theorems that we will have a consider-like future. I mean, outside of. Uh, Let's run a black hole. So we're expecting a consider like future. The, the quick argument about classical systems suggests few, if any, Boltzmann brains. But cosmologists expect there to be infinitely many Boltzmann brains in our consider like future. Is that a kind of reliable sociological um, statement? Uh, I would not say they're reliable because they always say classical. No, no, I'm no, 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 no. It's, it's just the claim that it's the dominant view right now. True. Uh, okay. I don't think it's dominant. Okay. <laughs> Less than dominant. I mean, but, I, but I would say East Coast is against it, West Coast is. Okay. All right. Uh, so the dominant view among West Coast cosmologists. <laughs> <laughs> now here in the Midwest, you know, we can we can rise above those coastal prejudices. <laughs> um, wait a minute. Do I? Yeah. Okay. So here's here, here's a nice. Uh, there you go. This is a West Coast paper. <laughs> Very clearly. Go back to New York. Okay. Um, so there's these problems. We, let's not talk about them. Um, they occur when we think about consider like cosmologies uh, because we think about the whole space time. That's the wrong thing to do, right? Uh, now it's the static patch alone we should think of. Okay. Remember, like. Ten years before this paper, it was uh, the cosmological patch, which you think of if we were like, being realistic about how much we could see. But according to these guys, no, it's not the it's not the half, it's the quarter. Okay. Um, so because if you go beyond the static patch, you're talking about regions that have no operational significance to you. Right? So if I'm living here, this is me, I will receive signals from outside the static patch. And I can send signals outside the static patch. But it has no operational significance to me. It's the picture because I can't like send a signal and I go check and make sure, or like receive a signal and I go check and see. Right. So an example Carlo gave me the other day is like maybe I see a white cow from outside my static patch. Right. The light from from outside my static patch and I see a white cow. But maybe it's black on the other side. Right. I can, and I can't check that because it's outside my static patch. But that's that's the feeling here. Okay. Uh, so. They have no operational significance because they're outside of causal contact with uh, the observers. The remedy suggested by the black hole analog is obvious, so this is back to the observer complementarity thing. Restrict attention to the causal patch, uh, which is the static patch. As in the case of black holes, the quantum description of such a region should satisfy the usual principles of quantum mechanics. In other words, <laughs> the, the, the describes a closed, isolated box bounded by the observer's horizon. Okay, so we're thinking, okay, we've got the static patch. It's a volume of space which is constant in time. So it's like a box. So now we're like, okay, we're back to the Poincaré recurrence and all that. So we get the brains. That's, that's a quick way of putting it. Now, of course, we don't get brains if they're supposed to be built out of classical matter, because classical matter is like fleeing the box. Okay. But there's two routes to getting the brains in the static. These guys have in mind the first one, but a lot of people like the second one too. So the first one they like is the static patch is a finite region of space, so it should contain a finite amount of information. So its Hilbert states should be finite dimensional, and you get Poincaré recurrence for free in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So as long as we're thinking there's a quantum state in the patch, we're good. Second route, there's a privileged vacuum state. I'm putting vacuum in quotation marks because, you know, we already said we can't make sense of particles and so on, so it's, it might not be the best name for it. Uh, there's a privileged quantum 
in, in, no, in well-behaved quantum field theories on consider space-time, there's a privileged ground state. It's the unique Hadamard state that's invariant under the full disturber. If you know the whole story about uh, Hawking radiation from this point of view, you'll expect that if we restrict that vacuum state to the static patch, what we'll get is a thermal state. So the whole thing is not thermal, right? It's like nothing's happening, in a sense. But if you restrict it to, that's hard to make out because you don't have to have But if you restrict it to this patch, you get a thermal state. So you, observers are supposed to see a very cold bath of warmth. And uh, it's KMS, it's thermal with respect to the time translation isometry of the static patch. It's good. Okay, but then okay, now we've got a thermal state, so you know there should be arbitrary fluctuations in there. I mean, very low probability, but every once in a while there can be a work like this. If future's infinite, there'll be infinitely many. That's the argument. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I would get here sooner, but two more slots. Okay. So there's this one. I wanted to just make a final point, which is there's started to be there's starting there there are like a few papers out there that are trying to undermine this by. Uh, appealing to considerations about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. So there's this one by Tomalka, and there's a sort of related paper by uh, Goldstein, Tomalka, and Struble, uh, where they talk about this stuff. From a Bohmian perspective, they don't buy into the whole, let's just work on the stack path, path thing. They work on the cosmological path, which is the half thing. And, you know, basically because of the uh, cosmic no hair thing, if you put a Bohmian quantum field on this thing, and you work with a field ontology as your viable, what's going to happen to the viable field as t goes to infinity up here is each of its modes is just going to settle down to an equilibrium. So from a certain point onwards, you're not going to get any interesting fluctuations. So the dynamics of the viable field basically freezes. So you wouldn't expect there to be many Boltzmann brains, certainly not each one you would expect, in fact, expect there to be more functioning brains back here near the Big Bang than in the post uh, equilibrium fluctuations. Okay, and then here's another one. This is by uh, Body Carol Polak, appealing to many worlds. Right, so, just like a basic punchline to this paper is okay, yeah, we buy the whole thing about the static patch and there being a thermal state there, but if we're serious about many worlds, you know, these days, we don't just say, because uh, I can find a basis with respect to which, uh, you know, the wave function is non-zero in this component, that there's some non-zero probability of that happening. There is a kind of like old-fashioned thing you might get from Everett, where you're just allowed to pick any quantum state. You can either get a physical quantum state, you're allowed to pick anything and say, relative to this, how do things look? But that's not how we do it anymore. We do this whole decoherence story. And so in order to get to nail down this argument and say you should expect to see Boltzmann brains, you have to sh provide an elaborate story about why the kind of like Boltzmann brain basis is favored by decoherence at late times in the Sitter universe. And that seems like it would be really hard since basically everything is static there. It's not obvious there's any decoherence going on. Okay, good. So I mean, I, think, I hope it's obvious from those last two slides that there's uh, a lot of cool things going on right now um, about this to sitter stuff and quantum stuff and that uh, philosophers should be thinking about. Thanks a lot.